I'm Biff Turkleman. You see me in such fine quality, epic chemistry educational videos as The Scientific Method, Who Would Have Known, Part 1, and Moles and Kardashians, Is There a Connection? Today we're going to be talking about The Scientific Method, okay? And at this point, this is, I'm not going to be talking about this in class. I'm going to have you guys watch this video specifically that you guys write this down, okay? If you need to pause it because you need to write stuff down, feel free to do that, okay? I will put this up on YouTube as well as my WCS. So, let's get going. When we look at Chapter 1C, we're looking at how do we answer the scientific questions, okay? And some of it is going to be dealing with observation, you have to see what's going on. Now there's two kinds of data you can get. You get numbers data, or you could be looking at observational data. So numbers, quantitative, where we can talk about 5 grams, 20 seconds, 3 bubbles forming. Qualitative deals with description. It turned green. This freshman turned green and threw up. See, that would be, you know, a qualitative data. It's a description of a reaction that a freshman has had. Okay, now how do we answer it? We look at observation. We're going to look at deductive reasoning from general to specific. Okay, that's one kind of reasoning that we have. Example, any material floating on top of water is less dense than water. Okay, motor oil floats on top of water. Therefore, motor oil is less dense than water. Notice we went from general to specific. General, any material floating on water is less dense than water. That's a big general thing, okay? Then when we talk about motor oil floats on top of water, look, we're looking at something that's specific, okay? So we, deductive reasoning, we are deducing that, hey, water, any material floating on water is less dense than water. Motor oil floats on water, then it stands to reason that motor oil is less dense than water. Hmm, hey, how about something else like, oh, ice cubes. Ice cubes float too. But there's a reason for that. Okay, as we move on, there's another kind of reasoning called inductive reasoning, where we have known data to unknown general conclu conclusion. Now that may sound confusing, but there's another way to look at it. If something something then something something okay that would be inductive reasoning whereas in deductive reasoning we're looking at big to little like we did in the last thing inductive is the opposite we go from known data to unknown general conclusion so example sodium chloride potassium chloride dissolve in water therefore barium chloride should also dissolve in water Okay, let's keep going. Please stand by. We now switch to the scientific method presentation, which is the main thing that we need to talk about here. Scientific method brought to you by the Western Christian High School Science Department. Woo! 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 Okay. So, overview of the scientific observation, question, hypothesis, an experiment, and then data collection, and then conclusion. Now you might be sitting there saying, wait, that sounds like the steps of the scientific method. Yeah, but you say, well, the scientific method, you're only using it for science experiments, right? No, not really, because the truth of the matter is you actually use it in your everyday lives. You're just not aware of it because you do make decisions in your lives. You base it on certain things. For example, do I go out with this group of friends or do I go out with that group of friends? Do I go watch this movie or do I go watch that movie? You'd say, wait a minute, that doesn't have anything to do with science. Uh, that's my point. This is a process that we come to some kind of a conclusion, that we can do some kind of reasoning. Say, okay, what about the future? I'm not doing science in the future. Pshaw, right, maybe you're not. But here's the thing. In the future, what house do I buy? What job do I take? Can I afford the payments on my car? Can I get that Lamborghini Countach? 
or do I have to go and get the used Toyota Yaris? What can I afford when I work at, you know, Joe's Tacos or Joe's Burgers and I only get paid for it three bucks an hour? So those are kind of the real life decisions that you use this process any way you look at it because you're reasoning your way through. So let's go with it. So here's an observation. What is it you see happening? So here you see condensation outside the glass. Here's another experiment. So we're going to do two parallel experiments. You notice mold growing on the bread. Ew! Yeah, ew. Okay, experiment number two. Question number two. Okay, so question. How does the air temperature affect the condensation formation? Here, how does temperature affect how much mold grows on the bread? So hypothesis, what is it? Well, if you think about it, it's a suggested solution to the problem. It has to be something that we can test. We can't sit there and test the coolness of Justin Bieber with the 19 to 25 year old demographic. It's just not possible to measure coolness, okay? But on the other hand, we can measure the amount of downloads and CDs that have been sold. That we can test. Then we can measure the success of Justin Bieber. Okay? Now, sometimes we write these hypotheses as if then statements. If the idea behind that is it predicts an outcome. That's the thing. It predicts an outcome. Whether it is right or wrong, okay, doesn't matter. It's testing it to see what's working and what's not working. So, our hypothesis. Let's look here, experiment number one. If the air temperature is 25 Celsius or below, more condensation will form than if the temperature is greater than 25 Celsius. So here we have temperature 25 degrees Celsius and below. We're thinking that there's going to be more condensation that's going to form compared to if the temperature is going to be greater than 25 Celsius. Doesn't matter. Experiment number two. If the air temperature is 25 Celsius or below, more mold will be present than if the temperature is greater than 25 Celsius. Okay, great. Now we've got a hypothesis. We're going to test that sucker out. What is that going to look like? Well, we have to look at variables. Okay? So a factor that can be controlled, changed, or measured in some kind of an experiment. Okay? Types of variables. Okay, think about this. Well, what would be a variable if you had to go and you were buying a car? What would be a variable that would, you know, you'd have to control? Maybe the money that you have. If you have a thousand dollars, chances are you're probably not going to get that Mercedes that's brand new, candy apple red, okay, with the engine of doom on it. Probably not, I'm thinking. But if you go to the used car lot, that might make a useful down payment. But anyways, types of variables that we have here, there's that dependent variable. You know, when you're depending on something, like I depend on my car to get me to work. Okay, and there's the independent variable. And then there's the controlled variable. So we have dependent, independent, and control variable. So let's look at the variables, do we? Let's look at the dependent variable. In experiment, there we go. The dependent variable is a variable that we are going to measure or observe. You don't control the dependent variable ever. You don't. You have to, this is what you're going to see. This is. Think of this as your results. That's your dependent variable. Can I afford to buy this car? Yes or no? That's my dependent variable. So here we look how much condensation is measured. That's our dependent variable. Because that's how we're going to find out if our hypothesis works or not. In the second one, how much surface area of the bread is covered by mold. Again, that has to do with the surface area. That's there. Okay? 
That's, we don't control it. That's part of the experimentation process. Okay, moving on. For some reason, it's not. So here, the independent variable is the one condition we can actually change in the experiment. Okay? So, for example, here, example one, we can change the temperature to 45 Celsius, which is in the above 25 degrees Celsius range. We can alter the temperature. Okay? We'll see how much condensation that we're going to make with it. Cha uh, example number two, change the temperature to 15 Celsius for our bread, which is below the 25 degrees Celsius range. Yeah, so that kind of gives us an idea of what's going to be going on with our hypothesis. We're in the process of testing. So we can, we can do this. We can change that in the experiment. So we need to run more than one experiment. You can't run just one experiment and that's it, I'm done doesn't work that way, okay? So a controlled variable is, aka means also known as constant variable. Now, here's the idea. This is the variable that does not change at all during the experiment. So there are variables we can change like the independent variable, but there is also the controlled variable where it is you can change that in an experiment. So, the experimenter makes a special effort to keep other factors constant or the same so that they will not affect the outcome. So example number one, what about the type of drinking glass that we're going to use in our condensation experiment? It's the same. Okay, in experiment number two, we use the same type of bread, white, wheat, you know, throughout the entire experiment. Okay? Here's the thing. You'd say, well, wait a minute, what difference is that going to make? Well, let's look at the bread for a moment. There's white bread, and then there's wheat bread, and then there's other kinds of bread. There's sourdough, there's rye. Here's the thing. What if the mold is able to grow faster on white bread compared to sourdough bread? Or what if the mold is able to grow faster on wheat bread compared to white bread? See, you run into that, you run into those situations that would call your hypothesis into question. So when you're checking out something like, oh, you want to keep the same type of bread. Same thing for the type of drinking glass in our experiment. You want to keep the drinking glass the same way, same kind throughout the experiment. So what's the purpose of a control? A control is not being tested. It is something that we use to compare what's going on. If I have, no, let's move on here, okay? Yeah. So controls are not being tested. Controls are used for comparison. So for example, maybe for our eyes, for our condensation experiment, we don't put, you know, we just have a glass that doesn't have any water in it. Let's see if there's any condensation that forms on that. That's a control. We just use that for comparison. Okay? All right, let's move on here. So experiment. Do the experiment. Data collection. Again, what kind of data are you collecting? All right? For number one, for our condensation, is how much condensation is there on the glass based on the temperature. That would be one thing. Number two, when we look at data collection, is how much surface area of the bread is covered with mold based on the temperature. Again, above 25 and below 25 Celsius. So that's the kind of data that you would be looking at. Okay, sometimes your data would be numbers. Sometimes it would be the surface area that's covered. Or maybe, sometimes, it might be something else. It depends what your experiment is about. Conclusion. Notice the happy little Dexter. The answer to the hypothesis is based on the data obtained from the experiment. Okay, the answer to our hypothesis, whether it is shown to be correct or incorrect, is going to be based on the data that we got from the experiment. That's a key thing. Without the data, we can't do anything with the hypothesis. 
Okay? Then we have to retest the hypothesis. We have to. Why is it that we need to do this? In order to verify the results, in order to make sure that the results are legitimate. The experiments have to be retested. That's just the way that it is. Okay? In the natural experiment, scientists try to determine what variables are interacting. They're connecting with each other even though they cannot control it. Contrary to popular ideas, scientists cannot control every single variable that's out there. It's just not happening. Okay, so there are some things you have to look at the experiment and see, all right, what variables we can't do anything about. We cannot control it. Okay. There are surveys, okay, where we can randomly select a representative samples from a larger population. So if I look at the population of Western Christian High School and I'm surveying 25 freshmen, 25 uh, sophomores, 25 juniors, 25 seniors, okay, that's taking a small number, a representative sample from the larger population. Using the results, there's something called peer review. This is where scientists will share their information with other scientists so they can see, hey, is this legitimate or not? Theories, okay? If we have the evidence to back up our hypothesis and everybody's okay with it, it becomes a theory. And then, of course, there's scientific law, like gravity, for example. Apply to science, okay. Applied science explores the natural products and processes for specific applications, whereas pure science probes nature to learn new things about the universe that we live in. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for the scientific method. Hope you enjoyed it. This is Biff Turkle, signing off until the next time. Catch you later.